Thanks, first of all, for having me in Lumini. I think it's my third or fourth time, and it has always been a pleasure to be here, especially this time. Is there a, a, a feedback between different microphones? I just had the, the impression. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, I uh, thought I was supposed to say something very basic things about BSDEs, about backward stochastic differential equations, this uh, important tool of control theory of, from the stochastic side. Um, now I see that there are quite a few experts in the room. Maybe in my first part I will also tell you something new. In the second part will be more along as uh, René Camona was putting it along beaten paths. Uh, I will present basic uh, theorems about uh, existence, uniqueness, and uh, impo most important properties of BSDEs, if there is time enough. In the first part, I would prefer to uh, deduce BSDEs as a natural tool. They would fall out of, uh, so to speak, the needs of dealing with uh, a problem of financial mathematics of incomplete markets quite naturally, as you will see. And there I rely on an old paper by uh, Ying Hu uh, and my student uh, uh, Müller. Uh, as you will see, there, there are no similarities with the first two talks this morning. Just one little thing concerning the talk with René Carmona. So I'm not talking about big, uh, big uh, players and small players, but there is one thing that I would like to mention. One of the, one of, two of the big players that you mentioned, Goldman and Sachs, were just born five kilometers from my hometown. And they were small players at the time when they emigrated to the United States in the turn of the 19th to the 20th century. They were cattle traders in a rural area in northern Bavaria. Okay. Apart from that, so let me come to the example that I want to present to you, which is from financial mathematics. And I'm dealing with a small agent who is facing to have to insure a product that he produces and that he sells. So he has two sorts of income. He has income from trading on a financial market, and this financial market is given by a finite set of assets whose price processes are described here. We have a bond which is trivially taken to be, uh, to be one, and then we have 1D stocks, and they are of the sort of... Uh, uh, geometric Brownian motions, while well, sigma and B can be random, but anyway, they are D stocks, and the proportional increase of their value is given by this volatility matrix sigma ij, so we have an n-dimensional Brownian motion, so j here goes from 1 to n, and then we have D stocks indexed by i here, and there is a drift vector, which is given by bi. And here is the development, the, the, the uh, evolution of the price processes. If you want to write this well, in, a, in a vector notation, or in a scalar product notation, I forgot the scalar product brackets that will follow later here. So you get for the ith price process, you get sigma i multiplied vectorially or scalarly with the Wiener process here, and then you have the bi. If you extract, if you are able to extract the matrix sigma from this equation, you will produce a new process which is usually called the price of risk process, theta. So if you have enough ellipticity in your matrix, 
then you can take the inverse of sigma sigma star here, multiply by sigma star, call this whole thing theta, so that after multiplying by sigma, you get your b again. So after extracting this object, the sigma, no, the sigma from, 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 the, from the second part, from the drift part, you get exactly the theta, okay. So theta is the price of risk process, and we assume enough ellipticity. Anyway, this will not be important for what follows, because what I want to emphasize is just how a BSDE arises in this uh, model. So there is a second source of income for uh, the agent, which will come on the next slide. For the moment, I just can, can you read the green parts of my slides correctly? Okay. So um, this model was treated by Nicole uh, and El Carouille and uh, Rouge in 2000 for convex constraints. You will see as we go along that we can deal with non-convex constraints quite as well by our approach. So the convex or no, our closed constraints will be given by a set, a random set, which I call C tilde, which is a d-dimensional set, same dimension as the price processes. And I will call A tilde the strategies, the investment strategies of my agent. So P1 will be the, uh, the amount that he sets on price process number one, on the proportional increase of the price process number one. Pi D will be the one for the dth component of the price process. Uh, we will assume that our price, our investments, uh, take their values in this closed set. This closed set can, for example, be the set of integers. So if I'm forced to just uh, invest integer amounts of some currency, yeah? This can be, this can be an example of this closed set, okay? So once again, it's not supposed to be, con uh, to be convex. Okay, then there are some conditions that we need in order that our analysis is working. So we assume that x to the minus alpha, you will later see that this is related to the utility function. You can see it already here. This is related to the utility function. So e to the minus alpha times the stochastic integral, so this is the the amount of investment taken up to time tau, that this is a family of uniformly integrable uh, uh, random variables if tau runs through all possible stopping times in the interval from zero to a terminal time t with which our trading interval ends. Okay, so the investment processes are written here. So x pi is the wealth you obtain after time, little t, by investing with the strategies pi, so pi 1 up to pi d, into our financial market. The proportional increase of the prices is here. So this is the gain that you get from investing into all of the assets between 0 and t. You have to take the integral. And we can alternatively describe this by uh, extracting the pi, and then, as you remember, the DSI over SI will be, uh, could be written as sigma i times dw plus price uh, of risk theta t dt. So here we are. So I'm, sorry. I'm extracting, I'm already, ha I have already extracted the pi, then I extract the sigma i. Uh, and then I have the W plus theta ds here. So this is my wealth process of the small agent investing with a strategy, with a, set, with a, with a vector of strategies pi up to time t. Okay, so the preferences of our agent are measured by an exponential utility function. And the preferences, so the, the, the utility will be taken from terminal wealth. The utility function is this exponential function. You still can read the green? Yes. Okay, okay. Uh, I, I, can, I can hardly read it. <laughs> okay. So U is the exponential utility function. Alpha is fixed. 
Uh, so this is for all x in R. And OK, so now there is the first formulation. No, OK, I, f I forgot. No, no, now it comes. The second source of income for my agent is due to a liability that he has at time t. So he has, for example, to pay a certain amount of money to somebody that has bought a, a financial product from him. And usually we assume that f contains uncertainty, which is not generic to the financial market, which could come, for example, from climate or from his usual business, from some um, commodities. Um, so the market is not complete. and. Uh, the agent has to, so to speak, to hedge the uncertainty which resides in having to pay at the end of the trading interval this amount f. Okay, so now we come to the formulation of the utility optimization problem for that agent. So once again, he has two sources of income. First, investing into the financial market with his price process x x pi, and secondly, at the end of the trading time, he has to pay this liability f. And f has more uncertainty usually than is in those deep price processes in the, in the Brownian motions that drive those price processes. So the optimal utility problem, uh, the optimization of utility problem of our agent that our agent faces is this. So you take the utility of your income from trading on the financial market, that's the red part, minus what you have to pay at the end of the trading time, minus your liability F. You take the utility from that, you take the expectation, so expected utility, and you want to find the optimal strategy. I already wrote pi in A star in A tilde here, so A tilde once again was the set of natural admissible strategies. Now I do a first reformulation of my problem. In fact, I will do four reformulations and after the fourth, you will see how everything can be formulated in terms of backward stochastic differential equation. So here is the second reformulation. Before I give it, I have to introduce those effective processes so you saw that here we extract pi and we multiply by sigma. I call this product p, so pi sigma is p, so it's a new effective strategy if you like. I just multiply my uh, natural strategy with the volatility matrix and then I have an effective set of constraints. I take my old set C tilde of constraints and I multiply from the right hand side with the volatility matrix. This gives me the set of effective constraints C. And I do the same thing with my admissible strategies, multiply by sigma from the right hand side and get this A. I call this A now, P, C and A. So here is the price process once again in terms, now the, the um, wealth process of the agent due to investment into the financial market. If he uses strategy number P, strategy P, so it's x plus this integral where P is, in, is integrated uh, stochastically against the Brownian motion plus theta ds plus the price of risk ds. So this is the uh, deterministic uh, uh, integral. Okay, so here is the second formulation. Basically, it's the same as before, just with the new quantities P, C, and A. So V of X, the, um, um, yeah, the, the, the wealth function is the, it is the, uh, the supremum overall um, uh, strategies P in the admissible set A, and then I take my expected utility from terminal wealth given by the investment in the, in the financial market minus the liability. So you can also write it like this. If you uh, express the price, the, the wealth process XP as it was defined here. Okay, further on. So now I want to deduce everything from the so-called martingale optimality principle. 
What the Martingale optimality principle has to do with uh, BSDEs, I will explain on the next couple of slides. But let me now first talk about Martingale optimality. So assume that we can construct a family of processes, RP. So for each effective strategy of investment, I get one of those processes. And now I will require four properties. The first property is that it is constant at initial time. And this constant, in fact, does not depend on the strategy. That will be something that will be required later. The second property is that at terminal time, the process takes the value which is given by my utility of investment into the financial market minus the liability. So terminal wealth. Not the expected terminal wealth, but terminal wealth. The third requirement is that my process is a super martingale for any effective strategy. And in the fourth uh, requirement, I say that for a particular strategy P star, which will be the optimal strategy or one of the optimal strategies, it must not be unique. For this strategy is for P star, I have that my R P star is a martingale. So for, for at least one P star, I want it to be a martingale. It need not be exactly one, okay? Because, well, convexity would give exactly one. But we are not in a convex setting, okay? So, why does this solve, if, if I have such a family of processes, why does this solve our optimal investment problem? Let us just give the argument. Okay, so I want to optimize, as you saw on the previous slide, I want to optimize the expected terminal wealth from investment in the capital market minus liability. So this I want to, to maximize. So now let us take, for any strategy P, uh, I have expected utility, which is given here. Now I, so this is terminal utility, expected terminal utility. Okay, I say this expected terminal utility is equal to the expectation of RTP, because RTP was supposed, second line here, to represent the terminal utility, okay? So here I have the expected terminal utility in terms of my family of processes RP. I know from the third line that my RP is a super martingale, so that expected, the expectation of RTP is less than or equal to the initial expectation, R0P, now my initial constant does not depend on the strategy, so this is the same as V of X here, as, sorry, as V of X does not depend on the strategy, yeah? So for P star it would be the same. You can even go from this line to this line immediately, now from this line to this line immediately, the initial const, the initial value, the constant, does not depend on P. So I have the same for my hopefully existing optimal strategy P star. So the expectation of R0 P and R0 P star are the same. And this is the expectation of terminal wealth from this strategy P star because fourth line for this particular strategy uh, my RP is a martingale so that I have equality here. In other words, what I have ultimately estimated is this quantity for any strategy P by this quantity for the particular strategies P star and this states that the P star is, is linked to my optimal utility, yeah? So with, with, with constructing a P star, I have solved the problem of getting optimal utility, okay? So P star will be an optimal strategy. Now this gives me my next formulation. Now I come to 
construct this family of processes. And for this purpose, I use backward stochastic differential equations. So assume that I can create, I wrote already, I introduced a BSDE into the problem. Let me formulate it a little bit more carefully. Let me say, I want to introduce a dynamics into the problem, which at time t gives me, so to speak, the temporary value of my ultimate uh, utility f. So this will be the value at time t of my terminal uh, liability f. And it is given by a backward stochastic differential equation. OK, so the backward dynamics is written here. So you have a stochastic integral with a control process z dw. And you have a so-called generator f of my BSDE. And what I want to do now is I want to construct this f from the necessities of my utility optimization problem. From, well, the non-convex constraints, from the optimization, from the properties of f, and so on. OK, so I want to construct the generator of this uh, back, so-called backward stochastic differential equation. Let us rest a moment at this place uh, to say that I could also write this equation in a forward way. What would I have to do? So if I, if I write the equation for, for, for time equal to 0, I would get y0 equal f minus the integral from 0 to capital T z s dw s minus integral from 0 to capital T f of s z s ds. OK. In this equation, the terminal variable f is given. y0 is not fixed. y0 is given by nature once f has been determined. Here is the equation. Now to write it in the forward way, to write this backward equation in the forward, version, you just have to, well, you have yt, yt is yt minus y0 plus y0. So it's y0 plus, and then I have to subtract yt from y0, no, y0 from yt, so I have to subtract this from what I wrote on the slide. What will that be? So here, f, f drops out, and I get this with a plus sign, and the integral from little t to capital T with a minus sign. So I get an integral from 0 to little t, z s d w s with a positive sign. OK? And for the other, for the other, for the, for the generator integral, it's the same thing. I have it with a negative, with, well, minus here with a positive sign, and here with a negative sign, so plus integral from 0 to t, f of s, z, s, ds. This looks like a forward SDE, but of course it is not, because my initial value is not prescribed. It is given by the backward equation. So I should add y capital T, is equal to f in order to make this a complete system of equations. Yeah? So this forward equation plus this condition is, so to speak, equivalent to my backward equation. But I can write it in a forward way. And as you will see, in deriving the dynamics and in calculating the f, we will need this forward uh, representation. Okay? So it's a backward equation which is different from forward equations by the fact that the initial value is not prescribed. It cannot be taken to be, yeah, it, it will be deterministic, but it is not described. If the filtration is simple at the beginning, it will be deterministic or almost surely deterministic. But I don't know what y0 is. It depends, strongly depends on f and, of course, on the generator. OK, so with that, let's go back to 
the business of describing. So what, what we had on the, on the previous slide. So we wanted to have this family of processes RP with these four properties. So constant, independent of the strategy at the beginning. At the end of the time, I want to have the terminal utility from the both uh, from from the two sources of income i want to be i want them to be super martingales for all p and i want them to be martingales for exactly one or for at least one p star okay now this is as i said the temporary value of my terminal liability and what i do in order to construct my processes rt with index p, I just plug them instead of uh, instead of the it, instead of the random variable f here. Yeah, so I replace the random variable f by its temporary value given by y t. So this will be my R T P. Um, maybe I should have taken little t here as well. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that is a mistake. I'm sorry for that. So little t here and little t here, because I want my processes to be adapted anyway. This would not be the case here, of course. So, OK, now let's check the four properties. The first property is it is constant at initial time with a constant independent of the strategy. This is in case the fact, because at initial time, my uh, investment process will be little x, and my uh, backward stochastic differential equation will take the value y0. y0. This does not depend on p. So here I have a constant which does not depend on p. At terminal time, I want my terminal utility to be described. This is also true because at terminal time, this is correct, so I have x t, x capital T p here, and y capital T is f, okay? So this is my terminal utility. In between, I have that, I have to have that every, for every p, my process is a super martingale, and for certain p star, it is even a martingale. Let us check this. So how do you get this? These are two conditions that are not yet, ful be that are not yet fulfilled, and that, in fact, will lead to the description of our generator function f. Yeah? So how do we construct the f from those two conditions? This is what will be on the next slides. By the way, uh, I hope that you can follow the slides. As soon as you find that I'm moving too fast, I'm not moving fast. I don't have that many slides uh, for the whole session, uh, around 30, I think. That's all. And I, I'm, I'm not sure whether I will even cover all 30 of, of, of my slides. So, OK. But feel free to interrupt me, and I will go to the board and, and explain things more precisely if things are not precise enough on the slides and if I'm moving too fast. OK, so, so once again, we want to, de to, to design an F for this BSDE so that these two conditions are fulfilled. OK, for that purpose, we have to go into the definition of our processes RT, and we have to describe, well, the dynamics of the backward process, the dynamics of the forward process, and we have to see what we get. So here we are. R little tp, so here I have it again, the, the mistake. X little tp should be here, not X capital tp, yeah? minus yt, and the yt is here. So what do I get? Minus x is the uh, definition of the utility function, minus x of minus alpha of the, of the wealth. Here is the wealth. So my wealth is, here is the initial wealth. So, so here is the initial value of my investment process xp, little x. Here is the initial value of my backward stochastic differential equation y0. So I extract this quantity, exponential of a sum of 
objects is the product of the exponentials. So I can extract minus the exponential of minus alpha times x minus y zero. And what is the rest? So the rest, of course, is again x, with a, not with a minus once again, of minus alpha. And then comes, so the, uh, the, forward, the forward dynamics. So what was, my, what was the forward dynamics? So xtp, that was little x, plus integral from 0 to t, and then comes p s d w s plus integral 0 to t p s theta s d s with the price pro with with the process of of market risk theta yeah here so this was the forward process and here is the backward process now i have to subtract the two here it is so i get from subtracting the martingale part of xp no, the martingale part of, of, the, of the backward process here from the martingale part of the forward process, I get integral ps minus z sdws, as you see. Yeah? And for the, other pro for the other part, I have, so with a minus comes this expression, and with a plus comes this expression. So integral ps theta sds, with a plus, so here I have a minus, a minus, another minus, so I have f of s z s minus p s theta s here. Okay. And I want this to be a super martingale for any p and a martingale for particular p star. How do I get that? Well, let me first of all extract the contribution of the initial values and then make my martingale part in the exponent an exponential martingale. So how do I make this part here an exponential martingale? You to Gersanov's theory or, uh, well, linear stochastic differential equations. What I have to subtract is alpha square over 2 times the quadratic variation of this process here, which is integral from 0 to Tps minus zs squared ds. If I subtract this from this martingale part in the exponent, this process that I'm encircling now, the exponential is a martingale. So this is a martingale. What is the rest? OK, so I subtracted alpha square over 2 times this integral here. Then, of course, I have to compensate. I'm compensating it by writing well, here I don't have a minus, so I have the minus here, the minus of the exponential. So I have co to compensate this red uh, expression here, alpha square over 2 times this integral of the square ds, I compensate by writing plus alpha square over 2 ps minus zs square ds in the integral. The remainder was just the blue uh, generator to be calculated minus p s theta s multiplied by alpha. So alpha p s theta s and alpha f of s z s. So here I, the, the red part, this initial object doesn't do any harm, multiplied by this, this is the red part, m, I call it m p, this will be a martingale. And the rest will be something in fact, it is a process of bounded variation because there is no stochastic integral in the, in the exponential involved anymore. So it's a process of bounded variation. And it should be such that the product of the two terms is a super martingale. And for certain p star, the product is a martingale. So how do I have to choose it? Now let us take this kernel here. So let me extract alpha. The alpha will not do any harm. So if I extract alpha from here, I have f minus p theta plus alpha over 2 times p s minus z s square. I call this function q. It depends on p possible values of my strategy, and it depends on z, the possible values of my control process. OK? So I call it q of randomness p and z. 
it will be f, oh, randomness and time, of course, f of dot z here minus p theta. Theta is also to be, uh, taken to be a, to be a, a, a value in, in, in r, plus alpha over 2 times p minus z square. This function is the integrand of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a Lebesgue integral, which I have to take in the, uh, with a minus of the exponential to make up my process at. And this process, how do I get that the product of those two processes is a super martingale? Well, I will have to require that at is non-increasing, OK? So under which conditions at will be non-increasing? Here it comes. So here is the third formulation of my problem. You remember, initial, initial state and final state were, 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 were treated. And we, only, we were only left with the question, for any p, we have to get a super martingale. And for particular p star, we have to get a martingale. So these are the two conditions that follow from this after defining this kernel function that arises in this integral here. Okay? So what do I have to require? I want, once again, I want this process to be non-increasing. So here I have a minus of an exponential, so I want this process to be non-decreasing. Okay? It has to, be, has to increase. So what I want is that the kernel, alpha is positive, yeah? I extracted alpha, alpha is positive, so f minus p theta plus alpha over 2 times p minus z square Q, in other words, should be non-negative to make this process non-decreasing, okay? Here we are. So I want it to be non-negative non for any p and z, for all p, and for the martingale condition. So for the martingale, of course, this is already a martingale, so we want this process to be constant in other words, I want it to have an integral that is constant. In other words, the integrand should be zero. Okay? So I want the integrand q at p star to be zero. And this for at least one p star. Okay? How do I get that? Here is the q. So it was f minus p theta plus alpha over 2p minus z squared. What I do in order to show that these two conditions can be fulfilled, or to see how they can be fulfilled, is I do a, a quadratic uh, expansion of that, of that expression. So I have, what do I have? I have p minus z theta with a minus, but then I have to compensate with a minus z theta. Z theta, z theta. Yeah? So now I have a, a, an expression with, which compares to this one, which was already there in the beginning. Yeah? So alpha over 2 p minus z square, and here I have p minus z theta. To, to complete this, to complete the square in this expression, what do I have to add? I have to add 1 over 2 alpha times theta square. Then this object here will be a square. It is here. Yeah? I can extract alpha over 2, and then I have p minus z plus 1 over, one over alpha theta. So this is, this is that expression here. OK, the z theta that I have to subtract here in order to compensate for the addition of z, z theta here, and, uh, and the subtraction of 1 over 2 alpha theta square, which compensates for adding this here, that goes by itself, OK? So what I end up with is f of dot z plus this quantity minus z theta minus 1 over 2 alpha theta square. Now, this quantity will always be positive. And I want it to be, so to speak, commensurated with f. Remember that we have our non-convex constraints. So the p was supposed to take its values in our possibly non-convex set C. 
So my p minus z plus 1 over alpha theta square, this z plus 1 over alpha theta, you imagine as a point lying somewhere in the space, and then I subtract the p from it, and the p is supposed to be in my con non-convex constraint set uh, C. How, how small can this quantity get? It gets at most as small as the distance squared from the constraint set to this vector z plus 1 over alpha theta. It's always bigger than that, square. So this is the distance d from the constraint set c to my vector z plus 1 over alpha theta. It's always bigger than that. And, well, how do I get the strategy p star? I just have to find a p star which realizes the distance. And for that, I just need closeness of c, nothing else. No convexity, just closeness. I just have to find a point on the boundary of c that realizes the distance of the set c from my vector. So that, well, ultimately we come up with the conclusion, now how do I have to choose my f? So once again to the last, to the last slide. So I want my f to compensate for this square distance, and then I have to uh, take into account that I have some quantities here that need to be compensated. So I want Q to be non-negative. So in other words, F should be bigger than or equal to the negative of this red and green part. And the red part is at, at least as big as the distance squared. So I want my F to be minus the squared distance plus Z theta plus one over alpha theta squared. Okay, here it is. And I have to take this alpha over two in the beginning, yeah? So this must be my generator. F of z minus alpha over two times the squared distance from my constraint set to the vector z plus one over alpha theta. Theta comes from the price of risk. And then I have to compensate z theta in one over two alpha, uh, theta square. So this guarantees the super martingale condition for all p, and if I'm able to find a p star which lies on the boundary of, Z, uh, of c, so for which this distance is realized, I'm having a martingale. I'm realizing that, well, yes, as we saw, that my q p star z is equal to zero, okay? So P star is, 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 uh, is described by the condition that D of C, Z plus one over alpha theta is equal to D of P star. So I want a P star on the boundary which takes the distance, the minimal distance from any vector in C to this particular vector. This will guarantee my Martingale condition. So what I'm left with in order to solve my, uh, opt, my, my uh, Optimization problem is just, well, to find uh, a P star minimizing the distance. So here you have, I have depicted a situation in which you see that multiple solutions are possible here. Yeah, because I'm only requiring closeness and not convexity. This blue set here is my constraint set. And if my vector lies here, then I have depicted an arc on which the distance to my vector is always the same on this whole arc. So I can have multiple solutions of the problem, but I have solutions, okay? Well, and this leads me to an existence theorem. Well, of course, we, we need to verify, so we, we just calculated the generator. And now we need to verify whether, this was tacitly assumed in our derivation, uh, 
whether the BSDE has a solution. Yeah? In fact, what you get here is, you see, here is a square. So the Z appears squared. That means we have what is called in BSE theory as a, a quadratic BSE, quadratic in the control variable. Okay? This quadratic BSE has to be solved, and then we are done with our uh, optimal investment problem. So here is the theorem. I take the unique solution of a BSDE and here is my BSDE. The F was constructed. The F is once again here. If such a solution exists, then the value function of my utility optimization problem V of X is given by minus the utility of initial wealth by investment minus initial uh, state of the BSDE and the optimal, trading strategy, the optimal trading strategy uh, exists uh, and uh, takes values in the projection, okay, the projection of my constraint set C on a vector V is the set of all vectors in RD that take the distance. So on this arc, it's the red the red, it's, it's a red arc here, yeah? So, so the uh, value function is then given by something, uh, or the optimal trading strategy, P star, is given by something which lies in the projection of my, of course, random set CT. So you have to just solve a problem of finding a projection which is non-anticipating or something like that. This is what the problem boils down to once you have solved your BSDE. Now, of course, this BSDE is a quadratic BSDE. And now that I want to present the basic ideas of how to solve BSDEs, I will not talk about quadratic BSDEs, but I'm aiming at deriving an existence result and some other properties of solutions of BSDEs with Lipschitz conditions on the generator with which one sees that also this problem with quadratic generators can be solved, yeah? So, okay, we will now, okay, just a few remarks concerning the solution. So existence and uniqueness for BSDEs with quadratic, uh, which are quadratic in Z, that was dealt with by, uh, by Kobylansky in 2000. I need a measure of selection theorem to identify my optimal strategy or one of the optimal strategies on the projection of my constraint set, yeah? And I need BMO properties of those martingales for which the integrability or the uniform integrability condition that I wrote on my first slide was good enough. Uniform integrability of exponentials, this will give me all those properties. Okay, and for the remainder of that session, I now propose to talk about, well, more beaten paths. Uh, existence and uniqueness for BSDs with Lipschitz drivers. In the end, I hope to be able to derive some properties of solutions which already point un into the direction of being able to solve such more uh, complicated on uh, 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 BSDs that are only uh, locally Lipschitz, okay? Okay, so the spaces on which we work. Let, let us first, okay, the time horizon will be T as before. M is the number of dimensions I have, so I'm not working in one dimension, as in this simple example that I just treated. I work now in M dimensions, so Rm, yeah? Uh, the number of Wiener processes in my BSDEs will be N. So I have an n-dimensional Wiener process, W1 up to Wn. Its natural filtration is here, and it's a completed natural filtration, not to have any problems with adaptedness and so on. So L2 of Rm 
is just the usual space of FT measurable random variables that are normed by the usual L2 norm. H2 of Rm, these are now processes that qualify for the stochastic integrals in the stochastic integral part. So this is the space of all adapted processes and the norm is given by the L2 norm on the space 0t cross omega. So this is the square, the, 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 the L2 norm on the space 0t zero, zero cross omega. Basically the same as this. H1, the same, the same, oh, yeah. Yeah, the same object just with, with, with the square root inside the expectation, yeah? So that's, it will not be very important. What will be important, however, is this space of uh, processes, which is, well, point by point, it's the same as H2 of Rm, this space here, but it's normed in a different way, and this norming will then uh, lead us more easily to solutions of the BSDEs that we consider. So I'm not taking the norm that I described here, I'm blowing up the integrand xt square by the factor e to the beta t, okay? So this is the uh, two beta norm on the space of adapted processes that qualify for stochastic integrals. And H2 beta Rm, I call this space with this norm, yeah? So it's the same space point by point, but just with a different norm, yeah? The e to the, bet, the, e to the beta t is, of course, bounded above and below on the, on, on the interval from zero to t, so I get the same, same x, just with a different norm. That's, that's, the, that's the only difference. Okay, so these are the spaces. Now come the parameters of the BSDE. So, what was the F before? Terminal liability in the example will now be called Xi. Xi is the terminal condition. Just abstractly terminal condition. It's an L2 vector with values in Rm. The generator will as opposed to my example, where it only depended on time and on the, and on the control, it will also con, uh, 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 depend on the variable uh, y. So on the variable y here, yeah? So I have a vector, I have a function which depends on randomness, on time, on y, and on z. Z will, not, of course, now not be a one-dimensional object. It, so the, the Wiener process, which multiplies to it, is, M, is n-dimensional. So it will be an n cross m matrix, because it goes into Rm. An n cross m matrix. So this is a matrix. A matrix uh, of, uh, so z takes, takes its values in matrices. And the, well, the, the target space of f is Rm again. I will work under conditions that at zero, at the vector zero, so at y equals zero and at z equals zero, I have something which is square integral. And then I will suppose that I have uniform Lipschitz conditions as opposed to my example in which z appeared quadratically, this is now not allowed. I will assume that there is a constant such, such that for all pairs of vectors, so y1 in Rm, z1 in the space of matrices here, and y2, z2 analogously, I can estimate the difference or the increment of the generator by constant times y1 minus y2, where this y1 minus y2 is measured in the Euclidean norm of Rm, and z1 minus z2 this Euclidean norm is the, the Euclidean norm in this space of matrices, yeah? It's the Euclidean norm, or the Hilbert-Schmidt norm, if you like, yeah? Which is the same. Okay, generator F and terminal condition Xi fulfilling 
those measurability, okay, so I, I, I assume product measurable and adapted, of course, and then I assume H1, H2. So H1 is initial, con in, initial integrability, and this is Lipschitzianity. Uh, if that all is fulfilled, I speak about standard parameters. And for these standard parameter pairs, I want to find a pair of processes YZ which satisfies the backward stochastic differential equation which I wrote here in green. So terminal condition Xi, and then I wrote it instead of uh, in integral form, I wrote it in differential form. So dyt is equal to zt star dw. The star had to be added because I have vectors now, yeah? not just uh, not scalars. So z star is the adjoint of the vector z or the transpose of the vector z. It's multiplied by the vector dw, which is an n-dimensional vector as well. Yeah. So this is just a name of the scalar product of z and dw. And you might remark here that I do not take a minus sign, but I write a plus sign. This is for convenience. Uh, it does not matter because the Wiener process can be reflected at zero and it's still a Wiener process. So it doesn't matter. And minus f t z, uh, y t z t d t. So this is what replaces my generator here. Okay, and this is the, the differential form. Yeah, in integral form, I would write it in the forward way like this or in the backward way like this with the f replaced by the xi. So I want to find a, fair, uh, y, uh, to find a pair of uh, uh, processes y t z t satisfying this backward stochastic differential equation. I hope you do not, uh, um, you, you are not uh, 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 perturbed by the fact that uh, I, f I have to find a pair of processes as opposed to just one process for forward STEs. You always have to find a pair of processes even if the generator is zero. So if the generator is zero, what does your equation express? The equation is nothing but the martingale representation of a random variable f or xi, if you like, by a stochastic integral with respect to a Wiener process. And in this martingale representation picture, you write your process z as the integrant and your process y as the integrated process. So this pair is what we are looking for, even in this, well, non-linear uh, conditional expectation case. So the linear, linear conditional expectation case is the case without a generator, and if the generator is on, then you have, in, in, in terms of uh, Peng's uh, uh, theory, you have a non-linear conditional expectation. The, the F makes it. Okay, so we want to find a pair of processes fulfilling this equation. Now, how do you go? The method is, to use contraction and the contraction principle on a suitable Banach space. We just have to find this Banach space and we have to show that uh, we get a contraction by mapping approximative solutions on the next approximation of the solution, as you will see. Okay, so for this purpose, for constructing a, constra a contraction on a suitable Banach space, we have to derive, first of all, so-called a priori inequalities. This is the general and most uh, uh, frequently used method of constructing solutions of BSTEs. So how do we get a priori inequalities? We assume that we have two pairs of standard uh, parameters, f1, xi1, and f2, xi2. And we assume, it's an a priori inequality, so we assume that we know already solution pairs for these two uh, pairs of standard parameters. So for f1 xi1, I have a solution pair y1 z1, and for the other one, I have y2 z2. So these are solutions of our backward stochastic differential equation for the two pairs of standard parameters here. Okay, now I want to know 
if my standard parameters deviate by a very small distance, how far will my solutions deviate as a consequence of this? So I define the difference of my two solutions, y1 and y2, the first uh, component of the solutions. I call delta yt, y1t minus y2t, and here is the first mistake in this whole thing. Delta 2ft will be the comparison of the two generators, but on the solution pair of the second equation. So I should write y2z, uh, y2t here and z2t here, not y1. This is a mistake. I'm sorry for this. Yeah. So you have your increment of the solution process, and you have your increment of the generators on the second solution. And then I claim that for lambda, mu and beta, three parameters, lambda and mu are new, the beta is the old one which uh, was showing up in my norm. Yeah? Uh, remember, we have this norm here. So the beta norm, this is the beta from that norm. Yeah, okay. So I claim that for all triplets of pairs of this type, lambda and mu are new, we will see what they are. Uh, such that those conditions here are fulfilled, we will see these conditions appear in our calculation, so don't worry at this place. Um, uh, well, you, you, maybe, maybe just one impression. So given the parameters lambda and mu, they are fixed for certain other purposes. We have to be able to choose our, our parameter but better in the norm of the solution big enough to have such an, such an inequality. So these inequalities, you have to read them in the following way. So delta yt, y capital T, index one will be psi one, and y two t will be psi two. So the, the terminal conditions, so this is the difference of the terminal conditions of the two standard parameters. Here again, and here is the difference of the generators on the second solution. So I take the beta norm of the difference of the generators on the second solution, multiplied by one over mu square, and the expected difference squared of the terminal conditions. And I want to know, if I know these two quantities, so difference of the terminal conditions and the difference of the generators, how far do the solutions deviate? And this inequality just tells me that d delta in the two beta norm squared is less than or equal to this quantity. Yeah? The beta appears and the mu appears. And for the second component, delta z, which will be defined in the same way, so delta z is y, is z1t minus z2t. So for delta z, I have an inequality again in terms of the expected deviation of the terminal conditions and the expected deviation of the uh, increment of the generators. I, I think I should have written, I should have extended this expectation to the delta 2t here, yeah? So this bracket here should be here, yeah? So the expectation extends on this second expression and down here as well. Now, how do you get this? Um, first, first thing to do is we have to take, well, we have to express delta, delta y square in some way by the uh, standard parameters. So this is done by taking, well, first of, all, first of all, I have to be sure that everything can be integrated so that everything is integrable. So in the first part of the proof, I uh, show that uh, the soup of yt is L2 integrable so that I can make my theory work. Why is that the case? So my solution process is here. So I can write it in the integral form, yt equal y0, plus integral z d d w t minus integral f 
dt. So if you compare the supremum of yt with its description in the, in the BSCE, you get, so by the triangular inequality on the right-hand side, you had xi plus the, plus the stochastic integral from a little t to capital T. I, I would, yeah, yeah, okay, little t. And, and then the integral from zero to capital T f um, absolute value ds. So you can estimate the supremum of yt by, by the very solution, by these three quantities. And now, uh, to handle this, you uh, just have to use Dupes inequality. You know how to do that. Yeah? You, you take this integral here, you, you, you uh, decompose it into integral from zero to little t plus integral from zero to capital T. This gives you the four here, and then you have the soup taken care of by the soup here. Uh, by this stochastic integral. So the dupe, dupe inequality gives you uh, an inequality by this quantity here. And this quantity is uh, integrable because we know that our yz is in this space. Yeah. So this is why this quantity is integrable. Now we only have to see the integrability of this quantity here. But Xi was in H, uh, was in L2. Xi was in L2. And for F, I can argue in the following way. So for F, I have these two conditions. So I compare F at Y and Z with F at 0, 0, which is already integrable. And then I have F of YZ minus F0, 0, 0. And this can be dealt with by this Lipschitz condition. So basically, I get an estimate f of yz minus f of 0, 0, less than or equal to c times y plus z absolute value. But the y plus z absolute value is, of course, integrable, because I was supposing that y and z are in these spaces. OK, so finish. So, so we, we know that this is L2 integrable. And therefore, we get this integrability. Now it becomes more interesting, because now we have to see how to derive, once again, these inequalities here. So on the left-hand side, I have the increment of delta, or the increment of, Z, uh, of, of y, or the increment of z. And on the right-hand side, I just have the differences of the standard parameters. So standard parameter final condition and standard parameter f1 minus f2 on the second solution. OK? How do you deal with that? OK. First of all, you uh, use Ito's formula for this process. e to the beta s delta y s squared. This is a process on my interval from 0 to capital T. And I use Ito's formula. So Ito's formula tells me I have to differentiate first the e to the beta s with respect to s. And then I have to differentiate the delta y s according to its stochastic, uh, um, uh, uh, stochastic dynamics uh, with the square here. And I go from uh, little t to capital T. So from little t to capital T. So the value at capital T of my process is this, minus the value at little t is this. So now comes first the integral from little t to capital T of e to the beta s de derived after, after s. This is beta e to the beta s, and the, the rest is preserved, d delta y s squared ds. So this was the derivative of e to the beta s with respect to s. Now comes the, 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 the dynamics of ys, of delta ys, delta ys squared. What is delta ys squared? I can write it as twice delta ys times the difference of the generators at the two solutions minus twice delta s, delta ys, and then comes delta z s d w s. This was the stochastic integral. Your, the, the, the BSDE only contains, yeah, you see it here, only contains the stochastic integral. 
and the generator integral. So y1 would refer to z1 here and f1 at y1, z1 here and y2 with z2 and f2 correspondingly. So what you get here is just, well, this expression twice delta ys and then the uh, Lebesgue integral part of the delta y which is f1, y1, z1 minus f2, y2, z2, yeah? Scalar product ds. And then minus twice and correspondingly the stochastic integral part, which is delta z, dw, okay? Delta y, delta z, dw. So these are the red parts. I will treat them differently. And then comes uh, the quadratic variation part of my stochastic integral. So e to the beta s is preserved, and what is the quadratic variation? So the, the stochastic integral was delta z dw, so it's delta z squared ds. So this is the quadratic variation part. Now I collect my terms, the blue terms on one side. I take this to the other side, where this and this are already standing. So I get these three blue expressions, and they are equal to, and this has to be taken to the other side. So on this side, I already have e to the beta t times delta y t square. Yeah. So on, on the other side, on the red side, I want to have my differences in the terminal values and my difference in the generators on the second solution. So here I have this, this quantity, and then comes this one twice e to the beta s delta y s f1 minus f2. And here is the stochastic integral. Yeah? So here is the stochastic integral with a plus. I have to bring it to the other side. And this comes with a minus because I have to bring it to the other side. OK? So this last one is, 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 is that one. And the stochastic integral is here. OK? Everything clear? If, if you want, I, I go to the board, but I mean, the, the expressions don't get shorter that way. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, what I will do now is, here I already have a quantity that I have to compare with on the right-hand side to get my a priori inequalities. Now I want to treat this remainder here to get my a priori inequalities. The first thing I do or the first thing I can do is I take expectations of the whole thing. Because in my a priori inequalities, I have to take expectations. So I take expectations in this, in this equation. And what that does is it lets this term drop off. So the only thing I face is the estimation of this quantity, which basically contains the generators. OK. So. Uh, I now show that this quantity here can be estimated by, well, what I had here. So that's this one, plus something that only depends on the difference of the generators on the second solution. In order to do this, you can already imagine that there are parts which depend on the delta y and the delta z, if they are produced during my estimation, I have to bring them to the left-hand side of my equation. And by choosing better large enough, I will be able to show that what I transport to the left side will just enlarge the quantity there so that I have an inequality for this. OK? So that's the plan. OK. So I integrate in my inequality here, as I said, in order to get this integral, this, this martingale term drop out. And then I have just this. Uh, why did I write less than or equal to here? I don't realize, I don't see this, I don't see the, I don't see. Uh, if I were writing absolute value of f1 minus f2 here, that would have been justified. As I see it now, 
it is even an equality. Yeah? I just let the martingale part drop. So it's an equality. So now, the, the, main, the main thing to do is to deal with this quantity here. I start here. So I have to compare F1 on the first solution pair with F2 on the second solution pair. The first thing is I use triangular inequality and then I compare F1 on the first solution with F1 on the second solution. And then I have delta F2 here because this will be F1 on the second solution minus F2 on the second solution. So this is exactly my delta F, delta 2F. You remember it was here. So delta 2F was here. F1 on the second solution, I said, I told you this, this I had a, a mistake here, a typo. F1 on the second solution minus F2 on the second solution, okay? So here we are. F1 on the first minus F2 on the second, once again, is F1 my, on the first minus F1 on the second plus F1 on the second minus F2 on the second, so this is delta 2F. And now I use uh, Lipschitz continuity of my solution of my generator F1. How does that work? So I get this quantity, uh, so I, yeah, you remember the Lipschitz, con Lipschitz continuity was here. So I compare F1 on one pair with F1 on the other pair. It's less than or equal to constant times the comparison of the first components plus the comparison of the second components. So if I have F1 of Y1, Z1 here, and F1 of Y2, Z2 here, I'm getting Y1 minus Y2 here, which was delta Y, and here I get delta Z. So this is exactly what I wrote here. This quantity, this red quantity, is compared by C times, and then I have a delta Y plus a delta Z, and the green part is just preserved, okay? So now, I have to uh, continue estimating this. So this produces delta Y and delta Z, and I had the delta Y on the other side, or in these expressions, delta Y and delta Z, so I have to just separate uh, the appearance of delta Y and delta Z in those expressions and the green part. I ultimately want only the green part to be on the right-hand side, okay? So how is that done? So here is this expression again. I write this expression again with this estimate here, with this estimate. So here it is. Now I'm using my estimate. So the delta y with, I, I estimate the f1 minus f2 here that I'm encircling now by these quantities that I just saw, yeah? So c delta y, delta, delta s y, delta s z plus delta 2f. And then if I multiply out, I get a C times expectation of delta Y square here. This is already something I want. But then I get a delta SY with a delta SZ. So a mixed term plus something in delta 2F, which is what I want. This mixed term disturbs me, still disturbs me. So now I um, use a further inequality to to, to deal with this contribution here. This is already okay. I want to deal with this contribution. So I name this quantity here Y, C, Z, and this I, I name T. So T takes real values, this takes real values Z, there is a C, and then there is a Y. And I have a two here, yeah? So 2 times y times zz plus t, very elementary inequality. I multiply out here, 2cyz uh, plus 2yt, and then I treat these quantities here with uh, 
an inequality, I can write that this is less or the C is preserved, and then the 2yz can be estimated by taking any constants mu at lambda positive. I can compare by y lambda square, so 2yz I can estimate by y lambda square plus z over lambda square. This is a very elementary inequality. So this is an inequality that deals with this term, the c is preserved, and the 2yt is estimated, so I have another independent quantity mu with y mu square plus t over mu square. Same elementary inequality. Now, down here I just collect the multiples of the different quantities, so I want y square and z square. So y square comes with a c lambda square here and with a mu square here. So this is my y contribution and then I have a t over mu square that will be the green part and z over lambda square with a c here. Okay, now <laughs> this is what I wanted to estimate. Here is the estimate, and now I'm plugging this estimate in. So here I'm plugging it in. So originally I had this quantity, okay, which is copied here. Just with another color for this part, it's in blue and green. And now I'm using my inequality, so the first thing is just preserved, and then expectation of delta y delta z plus delta 2f, so I get by replacing y and z correspondingly, and also delta 2f here, with the, with the right quantity, with the right multi, multi, um, multiples, one over lambda square, one over mu square, or, 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 or these quantities here, I get, so this, this, the, the blue parts are here, and the green is here. And this, well, if I collect terms, so now I only have delta y square, delta z square, here I have another delta y square, and I have a delta 2f square. So I collect terms for the delta y square, it is 2c plus lambda square from here, and mu square, which comes from here. So this is the, 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 the quantity I have to multiply to delta y square, expectation of delta y square, e to the beta s, of course. The delta z square comes with this quantity, and the green part was already there. So now I go back to, well, essentially, this equation, which was modified by my estimates that I just derived, and I plug in everything. So what I get is, so I take the e, so what I do? I take these two quantities and bring them to the other side of my inequality where I compare them with the result of the estimate of that, which I just got. So here you see, so I bring them to the other side. That accounts for the minus beta here. The quantities, the c times 2 plus lambda square plus mu square, they were already there, and they result from my, from my previous inequalities. And for the other term, for the delta z square, the minus 1 comes from taking it to the right-hand side, and the c over lambda square comes from my estimate. Yeah? And the green part is just as it was. Now, you see that if, if I choose my beta large enough here, I will have that this quantity in square brackets is negative. If I choose beta large enough. 
then this quantity will be negative. Yeah? And if I, if I choose my lambda large enough, so let me start with lambda. I choose, the C is given. I choose my lambda large enough so that this quantity is negative. So that I can omit it on the right hand side because everything else is positive. Yeah? Then cho chosen lambda, I can choose also the mu and then the beta large enough so that this quantity is negative so that the whole thing results in, yeah, well, the only thing that is preserved is this quantity, this quantity plus the green part. So here we are, this quantity plus the green part. So I've estimated my derivation of delta by the derivation of the terminal condition and the derivation of the generator on the second solution. So this is what I wanted to come up with. So this is my claimed inequality, I just recall. So here I claimed it, and just by estimating this quantity in the right form and uh, completing squares or so, I came up with just this estimate. So, if I now want the first inequality of my, of my a priori inequality, what I have to do is I have to integrate in time. Yeah? So far I only integrated with respect to the expectation, and then I have to integrate in time, and I will get the right quantities. The integration in time, on the right hand side, so on this, on this quantity, it will just produce a t because it does not depend on time, yeah? So here I get a t, and if I integrate in time here, I change variables and I get this quantity here. This quantity here, yeah? So now I have an estimate of delta y with the terminal with the difference of the terminal states and the difference of the, quant of the generator on the second solution. To, to, de to derive this one, I do basically the same thing. Uh, I use my, my inequality that was just derived. So the second inequality, I take this term to the left-hand side. I do not take this term into account at all. And since I was choosing my lambda large enough, on the left-hand side, this quantity will be positive. I'm just, well, taking lambda square over C minus lambda square to the other side, and I get this. Yeah? That's it. So I have these two inequalities. Now, this is the a priori inequality that leads us directly into the solution or the existence of a solution of the BSCE. So here we are. If I have standard parameters, then there exists a uniquely determined pair YZ of solution processes with this property, so that is just the BSCE. Okay. So, I said, in order to prove the existence of a solution for this BSDE, we need a contraction, we need contraction on, on respective Banach spaces. So, what do we do? We take an approximative solution YZ, little y, little z, and we map it to something we get by using the Martingale representation, as I, will, as I will just show. So I, I take one approximation of a solution, little y, little z, and I find processes big Y, big Z, fulfilling this equation. So this is an approximation of my BSDE. If I had the fixed point, I would have my uh, solution of the BSDE. Yeah? So here I just take one solution pair, one approximative solution pair, and I produce the next one. 
And this gives me, this gives rise to the following mapping. So I take little y, little z, approximate, previous approximation, to big Y, big Z, consecutive approximation. And I just have to show that this mapping is a contraction on a Banach space. A fixed point will then give me a solution. Yeah? Because then I, I will be able to have the same y and z here as here. Then I have a solution. Okay? And the contraction property is just given by the a priori inequality that I was just proving. That's basically everything in that whole story. OK. First of all, I will have to show that this, quant this, this equation star has a solution. So given y and z in those spaces here, I will have to produce big Y and big Z again in these spaces so that this equation is fulfilled. How is that done? So this process is basically given and to obtain this equation, one has to find a clever way of applying the Martigel representation theorem. So this is how you go. First of all, by our assumptions, Xi plus an integral of F on my previous solution, little y, little z, will be in L2. I re just recall what we did in order to show this. Xi is in L2, and f on yz can be estimated on f of 0, 0, which is in L2, plus y absolute value plus z absolute value, but the y and the z absolute value are in those spaces, so they are square integrable as well. Okay, so this is how I get that this whole object is square integrable. Now what I take is a Martingale representation for the quantity xi plus the, entire, the integral over the entire interval of my generator on the solution little y little z, on the approximative solution little y little z. So I take this quantity, I know it's integrable, so that Martingale representation gives that this process here, the conditional expectation, so projected down on Ft, is a martingale. It's even a square integrable martingale, uh, because we know square integrability for this. So, it's a continuous one. We are on Wiener filtration. And uh, so martingale, the martingale representation theorem uh, provides even a process Z uh, which fulfills this equation. So here we have a martingale in the Wiener filtration, and for the Wiener filtration we have martingale representation so that we can represent our M by this equation. Now comes the definition of Y. So I take my martingale minus the integral of the generator on the, small sol on the solution with the small letters ds up to time t. I claim that y is square integrable and that we have this, quantity, this, this equation. Now, why is that so? Um, OK, you can write your y as m, but m can be written in this way. So conditional expectation of xi plus the entire integral of f ds. And then you have to subtract the integral from 0 to little t from this integral so that the integral from little t to capital T remains besides xi. So this is another representation of y. OK? And then y capital T will be y capital T will just be Xi, because this integral is then a trivial one, so it's Xi. Y capital T is Xi. And Y capital T, on the other hand, can be also described by uh, M capital T minus this integral. So M capital T is M0 plus this minus this integral from 0 to capital T. So that Y finally can be expressed as Y capital T minus Y0 minus M0 plus M0. Y, y, y little t minus M0 plus M0. Oh, wait. 
I'm subtracting Y capital T and then I'm adding Y capital T again. Y capital T is Xi and I'm subtracting Y capital T. This is that quantity here. So I'm, and, and then I'm adding Y little t, which is here. I, I did the same trick here, yeah? So what you get is the, the M0 drops off, the Xi is preserved, and the stochastic integral goes from little t to capital T, and also the <coughs> Lebesgue integral here goes from little t to capital T. So it's this expression, but this is exactly what we wanted, yeah? So this is the quant, this is the, the equation that we were claiming here, okay? So we have constructed the pair Y, capital Y, capital Z, given little y, little z, so that this equation is fulfilled, okay? And now I have to show that it is a contraction. For that purpose, what I do is the following. I compare little y's, little z's, with capital Y's, capital Z's. So I take a pair little y, little z, and another pair, and then I take capital Y, capital Z correspondingly with version one, version two, solutions to my start equation that I was just showing, okay? And then I can apply lemma one, and now you will be surprised. C equal to zero. The C was the Lipschitz constant for my generators. Why can I take it to be zero? Because my generators now do not depend on the processes I produce, the capital Z, capital Y, capital Z, just on little y, little z, yeah? So I can apply my first lemma with C equal zero, beta equal mu square, and Fi as these generators. So there will not be, yeah, there will be a, a difference of the generators on the second component, but there will otherwise no, be no difference because it does not, they, do, they do not depend on capital Y and capital Z. So this is what my lemma gives for the increment of Y, and this is what it gives for the increment of Z. So I just have a beta in the denominator, and the difference of uh, the generators, so the difference of the generators on the, on the second solution. The second solution is, is trivial here, yeah? This is just the difference of the generators. Now I add the two, yeah, Lipschitz continuity of F first of all. Lipschitz continuity of F now allows me to replace this difference of the generators by differences of little y, so delta little y, y1 minus y2, and z1 minus z2, delta little z, also in the two beta norm. So this is the first inequality. And here is the second inequality. And finally, I can add these two inequalities together in order to get a contraction for big beta again. So the, if I add the two inequalities together, I get this. With this constant, you had the beta in the denominator in both expressions, 2tc plus and 2c in the numerator, this is here, and beta in the denominator, and here you have the delta capital Y and the delta capital Z compared with the delta little y, delta little z, and th this, is, this is my quantity. Uh, that I can get less than one by choosing better large enough. So again, by choosing better large enough, I can obtain a contraction property for my, uh, for my pairs of processes uh, with these norms. So if I choose better large enough, I, th I, th I think I said better bigger than two times one plus t plus c, you see, if, yeah, if, you, if you choose it just like that, so that beta is bigger than this quantity, this, this quotient here will be less than one and I have a contraction. 
And if I have a contraction, the rest is trivial. I, uh, the fixed point will solve my equation. I, you do not have to read this. That this is. And uniqueness is, again, a consequence of contractivity of gamma and the uniqueness of the fixed point. So we have existence and uniqueness due to the um, a priori inequalities. And this is the, 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 the standard uh, uh, sequence of arguments for solving BSDEs. You, so, you, you write a, a, an a priori inequality, and then you uh, show contraction, something like that. Yeah. Um, now I'm looking at the watch. I had in mind to tell you something about, well, OK. You might now ask yourself, as in the SDE case, are there cases in which I can construct the solutions explicitly? In the, in, the BSDE, in the BSDE setting, this is usually not possible anymore. There is one exception, which is linear uh, BSDEs. Uh, I think René Carmona has considered uh, lin a linear version of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, uh, of, the, of the BSDE version in his setting this morning. I could do that now, but I think uh, we are now over one hour and 45 minutes, so I, I could also stop. Yeah? The main, I have, I have shown you the main things that I wanted to, yeah, so. Okay, the, so just, just what, what for, so if you, if you solve uh, linear BSDEs, you can solve them explicitly, and from that, you can derive the comparison principle, which says that if you can compare terminal variables, Xi1 and Xi2, if Xi1 is less than Xi2, and if the, if the generators are the same or ordered in the same, in the same way, then the solutions will have the same order. This is the comparison principle. Now, with the comparison principle, you have an entrance to solving the problem that I was explaining in the first part of my of my presentation with the quadratic BSDEs. So if you have quadratic BSDEs, BSDEs that just fulfill local Lipschitz conditions, you would like to approximate their solutions by uh, solving BSDEs with global Lipschitz conditions. So in this, in this setting, you would, do, you would do the following. You would uh, truncate your generators by smoother, uh, by, by, by generators with global Lipschitz conditions in a way that makes them, that makes the comparison principle applicable. So that after truncating, you will have solutions, you will have a whole sequence of solutions. By comparison, you can show that they increase or decrease, whatever, whatever, whatever is needed, and then uh, by, by local limits, you get, uh, you get a solution of the, of the quadratic BSDE by the comparison principle. And the comparison principle can be derived via uh, the uh, explicit uh, solution for linear BSDEs. Okay. So this is missing, but I think uh, time, is, time has, has elapsed. Thank you very much. Thank you for this uh, very nice introduction. So we have time for some questions. Uh, yes. um, so in slide 21, uh, can you please 21. Yeah. Can you please explain once again how uh, the first line belongs to L2? Okay, so Xi is part of a standard parameter. So this belongs to L2. And then, okay, you can estimate this integral by integral from zero to capital T, absolute value of S at Y as Z as DS. Okay, now your generator possesses uh, Lipschitz, Lipschitz continuity is, is Lipschitz continuous and its, its state, so f of uh, 
uh, y, if, I, if I replace y with 0 and z with 0, then f of 0, 0 will be square integrable. Okay? And then I can compare f of y, z with f of 0, 0 in the following way. So I write absolute value of f of y, z less than or equal to triangular inequality f of 0, 0 plus f of y, z minus f of 0, 0. And f of y, z minus f of 0, 0, for this I use um, the Lipschitz continuity. I can estimate it by constant times y plus z absolute values. And the y and z, they are already known to be square integrable because I was taking them in this product space. So that's the point, OK? Thank you. Yes? So my question is, um, is there any uh, regularity result about the solution? Uh, yes. Uh, y is continuous, and Z not, need not be continuous. OK. Um, but any, what, what would you expect? Like holder continuous, something like that? Yeah, I think you can derive it from the holder continuity properties of the Brownian motion. So it would, I guess, have the same Hölder regularity as a stochastic integral. OK. Thank you. Any other questions? OK, if not, let's thank Professor. Ah, sorry. Okay. Um, excuse okay. me. Um, oh, there's another one? Okay. Yes. For the optimal martingale problem at the beginning, in yeah. fact, yeah. when you arrive to um, the result, PT is the projection yeah. of ZT plus this yeah. term. In fact, in this term, th there is ZT, ZT, the term ZT at the beginning. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Mm, yes, it's the projection of. Yeah. So P PT uh, star, it's um, the projection of ZT plus uh, the yeah. ZT. Uh, so here I didn't uh, um, well understand ZT. We, we look for ZT or it's. Here it's not no, given. Z is given. Z plus and here, theta are given, the, and I want I want the, I want the optimal strategy. But. Um, so here, Z is given when you rewrote it, in fact? OK. Um, so for, for, for your BSDE, you need the generator. Yes. And the generator was this here. So you need the distance mm -hmm. from the constraint set to Z plus 1 over alpha theta. OK, yeah? so the solution we found. So the but generator that, um, will depend on z and on time, but not on the optimal strategy. The optimal strategy will, will then be chosen, if that was your question. Um, yes, no, but, but because I have, um, I understood that we are looking for a link between the Martingale optimal problem and the, the usual resolution of BSDU. No, so the, that's the, why the, I was thinking that the link we, was the link hmm. was the Martingale optimality principle is expressed by uh, the choice of a generator of a of a particular BSTE. That, that was that was my point. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Thank you again. Thank you.